Hi everyone, it's been a while since my last video so I thought I'd share a bit of research I've done into Oxfam. You might have seen people from Oxfam hanging around outside your local train station or shopping centre recently, so I figured it's probably best you knew something about them. Oxfam was a charity founded in 1942 under the name of Oxford Committee for Famine Relief. It was set up by Cecil Jackson Cole and managed predominantly by him throughout the charity's early years. Initially, the charity was supposedly set up to persuade the British government to allow food relief to get to Greece. At the time, the Allied side in the World War II was blockading supplies to Greece and Oxfam's primary stated concern was to feed the starving Greek people. Rather than dwell on the history of the organisation, which is more difficult to properly research due to the inavailability of documents more than about a decade old, I shall focus on who is running the charity today, who is funding it and what they are doing. The new appointment for Chair of the Board of Trustees for Oxfam GB is Caroline Thompson. She will start her role in October 2017. This is how she is described in her biography on the Oxfam website. Caroline Thompson is Chair of Digital UK, the body which is responsible for digital terrestrial television, and Chair Designate of Oxfam. She is a non-executive director of the Vitec Group PLC, and Chair of its Remuneration Committee, and of CN Media Group. She is also a non-executive director of UK Government Investments and chair of its remuneration committee. In the arts world, Caroline is a trustee of English National Ballet, where she recently retired as executive director. She was trustee and deputy chairman of the National Gallery until 2016 and is a trustee of Tully House Gallery in Cumbria. She is deputy chair of NHS Improvement and a director of London First. Caroline stepped down from her role as Chief Operating Officer at the BBC in 2012 after serving 12 years as a member of the Executive Board. She had previously been Director of Policy and Deputy Chief Executive of the World Service. She was Founder Chair of the BBC World Service Trust. Caroline received an Honorary Doctorate from York University in 2013 and was made an Honorary Fellow of the University of Cumbria in 2015. She is a member of the Council of the University of York and a trustee of The Conversation, an online independent source of news and views. For any of you not so familiar with the fact that the BBC's role is to support the British government and the British royalty, please investigate them for yourself. I shall leave a link here to James Corbett's documentary, BBC Exposed. I'll also just read a couple of segments from a January 2017 Guardian article entitled David Clementi set to be named as government choice for BBC chair. Sir David Clementi, the author of a report calling for the BBC trust to be scrapped, is expected to be named chair of the corporation this week. Theresa May is expected to reveal the government's preferred candidate to lead the BBC's new unitary board in the coming days, with the official appointment then made by the Queen. Clementi is the preferred candidate of Karen Bradley, the Culture Secretary, who has put forward his name to May for approval. The Prime Minister is understood not to have made her final decision, but is expected to approve Bradley's recommendation. The Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee is understood to have scheduled a pre-appointment hearing with the government's choice next Tuesday. And skipping a bit further down, Clementi, the former Deputy Governor of the Bank of England and former Chairman of Prudential and Virgin Money published a report in March calling for the BBC to have a unitary board consistent with the model used by large publicly listed companies. The government adopted the recommendations of his report, which described the existing BBC Trust as flawed and said it should assign oversight to media regulator Ofcom. So, the government requested Clementi's report and paid him to produce it, and when he finished it and handed it back to the government, they said, this is great, you must run the whole organisation. Well, what a set-up. So now, as well as having a Prime Minister who used to work for the private central bank, the Bank of England, now we also have the head of the BBC, who used to be the Vice President of the Bank of England. Well, as we know, government, media, banking, they're all part of the same establishment, and they switch roles all the time. How much more clearly corrupt can you get? So basically, between the government and the Queen, they decide on how the BBC is run. So much for being impartial. 
The BBC is one of the most obviously and provably biased media organisations in the world. Of course, government violence, or the threat thereof, is used to get people's licence fees off them. If you're paying your licence fee, you're funding pedophilia, war and elitism. Caroline Thompson is also the wife of Roger Little, or Baron Little, described in Wikipedia as a British political advisor and consultant who is principally known for being special advisor on European matters to former Prime Minister Tony Blair and President of the European Commission, Jose Manuel Barroso. He also worked together with Peter Mandelson on books outlining the political philosophy of the Labour Party under Blair's leadership. It concludes that Iraq has chemical and biological weapons, that Saddam has continued to produce them, that he has existing and active military plans for the use of chemical and biological weapons, which could be activated within 45 minutes, including against his own Shia population, and that he is actively trying to acquire nuclear weapons capability. Iraq could attack us within 45 minutes, Blair, the lying sack of shit war criminal said. He dragged us into a bloody war which resulted in millions of deaths and millions more being permanently displaced. The damage he caused to Iraq and Afghanistan must not be forgotten, and we must not let time soften our attitude to him. The suffering that Blair caused still goes on to this day. And it was all for the banking interests he was really working for the whole time. Roger Little still works with Peter Mandelson at Policy Network. In their own words, a leading international think tank and political network, of which Mandelson is the president and Little is the co-chairman. The chief executive of Oxfam GB is Mark Goldring. Before Oxfam, he was chief executive of MenCap, the UK's leading voice for learning disability. He was also chief executive of Voluntary Services Overseas, VSO, in which he worked alongside the United Nations Development Programme and the UK's Department for International Development. He's also the chair of the Shady British Overseas Aid Group, BOAG, an umbrella agency representing Oxfam, ActionAid, CAFOD, Christian Aid, and Save the Children, but they don't even have their own website. The Deputy Chief Executive is Penny Lawrence. She joined Oxfam in 2006 as International Programmes Director. She is also the Chair of Refugee Action and sits on various advisory committees, for example the Oxford University's Centre for the Study of African Economics and IKEA's Sustainability Advisory Board, and she was the Chair of ICVA, International Council on Voluntary Agencies, from 2012 to 2015. She was, like Goldring, employed by the VSO before joining Oxfam. Going through the trustees and executives, there are lots of interesting links and similarities. Tim Hunter, fundraising director, also worked for UNICEF and the NSPCC. Jack Lundy, communications director, used to work for Save the Children on their Syria campaign, and before that, the BBC. Cherry Ann Matthews, international programs director, worked for Action Aid. Matthew Spencer was head of government affairs at the Carbon Trust and was campaign director at Greenpeace. Karen Brown, current chair of the trustees of Oxfam GB, was vice chair of Action Aid International and chair of Action Aid UK. She also had senior roles with Channel 4 and Granada Television. Gavin Stewart, vice chair, was chief executive of Resolution Asset Management. David Pitt Watson, honorary treasurer and trustee, is chair of the UN Environment Programme's Finance Initiative. He worked with Del Watt early on in his career before becoming finance director of the UK Labour Party. Ken Caldwell, Oxfam trustee, is the executive director of WaterAid International. Ken has worked as the international programs director of Save the Children, as chief executive of Sussex Enterprise and deputy director of voluntary services overseas, and as a consultant with McKinsey & Co. He also set up his own consultancy firm, Caldwell Consulting, to advise NGOs. Kul Gautam, trustee, was Assistant Secretary General of the UN, Deputy Executive Director of UNICEF and has board positions in more than 30 other organisations. Lois Jacobs, trustee, is worldwide CEO of Landor, an international branding and design consultancy. Wakas Khan, trustee, is currently Chair of Mosaic, a charity founded by Prince Charles in 2007. 
Earlier in his career, Wakas worked with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, engaging with the Islamic World Group, and was a member of the Faith Advisory Panel of Experts to the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government. He is also a Fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Liddy Nakpil, trustee, is involved in many organisations, mostly in Asia, and connected to climate change, just like the Global Campaign to Demand Climate Justice and the Philippine Movement for Climate Change. Ruth Rudderham, trustee, is Director of Development at the Prince's Trust International. She has worked for Christian Aid, Friends of the Earth and Crisis. Katie Stewart, trustee, was Vice President of Citigroup and consultant for KPMG. She works for the King's Fund, a UK health policy organisation, and is a trustee of AMREF, African Medical and Research Foundation. Nakoyo Toyo, trustee, is a Nigerian politician and was Nigerian ambassador to Ethiopia. She is a lawyer by trade and has worked with many development partners, including the United Nations, World Bank, European Union, Department for International Development, and UNIFEM. Steve Walton, trustee, is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales and, for 24 years, was a partner with auditors PricewaterhouseCoopers. So they're the trustees and executive staff working at Oxfam GB. Now let's have a look where their money is coming from and where it's going. In the financial year ending 31st of March 2016, Oxfam received nearly £75 million from various governments Easily the largest government contribution came from the UK government of just over £50 million. Governments of Austria, Canada, Denmark, Finland, Germany, Ireland, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland and the United States contributed a combined nearly £25 million. Multilateral organisations, as they call them, such as the European Commission, United Nations and the World Bank also contributed nearly £50 million combined. The UK Government's Department for International Development are funding dozens of projects through Oxfam, including in Syria, Yemen and Lebanon. The total annual income for Oxfam is approximately £325 million. At the end of their most recently released annual report, they thank many organisations, corporations, foundations and individuals for their donations. I'll reel off a heavily shortened version of this list. ActionAid International, Big Lottery Fund, British Council, Care International, City Foundation, Comic Relief, Disasters Emergency Committee, Dubai Cares, European Climate Foundation, International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, International Rescue Committee, JP Morgan Chase Foundation, George Soros's Open Society Institute, Rockefeller Foundation, Save the Children International, Spanish Red Cross, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, British Airways, eBay, Ford Foundation, Google, Heathrow Airport, Marks and Spencer, Nokia, PayPal, Sainsbury's, Spa UK, the Cooperative Bank, the One Foundation, Unilever, Visa and Volvo Group. The combined wealth, this is according to Oxfam, of the world's 85 richest people is equal to the 3.5 billion poorest people.
Where are you anyway? I'm in an internet cafe. We had to move here for Dad's new job at the mine. School here is so bad. They have trouble keeping the electricity on, let alone any internet. <laughs> Sounds gross. the exams. I didn't go. What? Are you kidding? Don't you want this opportunity? My dad died. I'm running out of time. I need to go take care of my brothers. I just wanted you to know. Sophia, don't go. The world's 85. The world's 85. 85 richest people. The rich are getting richer. Oxfam said today the combined wealth of the richest 1% will overtake that of the other 99% of the population by 2016, unless the current trend of rising inequality is checked. The richest 1% in the U.S. have received 95% of the wealth. Las más ricas del mundo concentran. It's completely unsustainable. That was a video created by Oxfam at the start of 2015. While Oxfam are pretending that they care about poverty and inequality, they are directly working for those governmental and banking interests that are responsible for more poverty and inequality than anyone else. It is pure hypocrisy. Oxfam, as you would expect with their funding of over £300 million per year, and with their numerous media professionals on their books, have no trouble knocking together videos that pull at the heartstrings in an attempt to make the viewer loosen his or her purse strings, but there is no substance to any of it. I have shown you videos coming from the WWF, Save the Children, Amnesty International and Hope Not Hate, and they all have a lot in common. They are all very well produced videos with music and catchphrases, and none of them tell you how they are going to help. It's all sound bites and no content. This video by Oxfam I found particularly disgusting, not just for the shameless promotion of societally destructive social media, well of course they are funded by Google, but also because the people funding Oxfam, running Oxfam and benefiting from Oxfam are the very super rich establishment that Oxfam claims to object to the wealth of, and of course it's a complete lie. The people would be richer if the government didn't steal money from them in order to waste it giving it to organisations like Oxfam. Oxfam are conducting projects in Syria, funded by the UK government's Department for International Development. The same Department for International Development which has continued to fund Al-Qaeda's civil defence, the White Helmets, in Syria. If you don't know about the White Helmets, then please watch this presentation by Vanessa Beely. This will give you an insight into just what kind of organisations and projects are funded by the Department for International Development and for what purpose. On their website they list their campaigns. They include Iraq crisis, Syria crisis and Yemen crisis appeal. Do you think Oxfam are campaigning against the British establishment which is partly responsible for all of these disasters? Do you think they're putting pressure on the government to stop selling arms to Saudi Arabia who have been most responsible for the devastation happening in Yemen? Do you think they're exposing the lies like 9-11 that led to the invasion of Iraq? Do you think they're exposing groups like the White Helmets which are helping to destroy the lives of Syrians? No. In fact, they're part and parcel of the establishment that will slaughter, terrorise, impoverish and torture its way to achieving their objectives. Do you really think it would be getting project funding from the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and all those governments if this charity really wanted to take their wealth and power away? Oxfam is a parasite on the people, a much smaller version of the ultimate parasite which is government, but working to the same objectives. People like to think that there's a big organisation or charity out there that we can all trust, but the thing is, any charitable organisation worth anything will necessarily attack the power structures as it is, and make an enemy of the richest and most powerful people. Anyone who really understands how the world works and wants to create real change has to go to the source of the problem, not just try to deal with the symptoms. How long do you think organisations like this would last? And how big do you think they will be allowed to grow? 
Don't forget also that it's only through the government's charity commission that organisations are able to gain tax-free charity status anyway. OK, thanks a lot everyone. Please keep doing research for yourself and I hope to get another video out to you soon. Alright, lots of love. Bye.